You are listening to the Hiking Radio Network, where we talk the walk with shows by hikers, about hikers, for everybody. Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis. Join Steve and his guests every week as he staggers from Georgia to Maine. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, sponsored by Trailtopia Adventure Foods. This week, we have a listener who wrote to me several months ago to comment positively about the show and thank my guests for the help that she and her husband had gleaned from the various shows in our back catalogue. Once she called onto the podcast, she had binge listened and she wrote to me once she was up to date. I get lots of emails like that, but Anna's was special. I've been on the lookout for flip-floppers this year. I'm still going to say oboes. (laughs) And Anna and Brandon were about to start their own flip-flop from Harper's Ferry in May. I wrote back to her thanking her for her kind words about the show and asked if she'd like to be a guest once she and Brandon had completed 500 miles. Yep, you guessed it. They're past the 500 mile mark. So this week, they're sharing their story. I can tell you now, they surprised me in a really good way. Also, we had the return of one of our earliest guests, Caesar Becerra. Caesar and his former wife, Maud, were our guests in episode number five when they told of their thorough hike. And believe me, thorough was the right word. They spent over a year on the trail. Caesar is back in this week's instalment of If I Did It Again. (laughs) Yeah, plenty to say. Finally, we're finishing off Chapter 6 of The Year We Seize the Day by Elizabeth Best and my buddy Colin Bowles. Once more, Colin has slipped in a few beepable words and I have beeped him. I've also got some news about my plans for this show, so we've got plenty to fit in. But before we hear all of that, let's hear some of this. Do you remember those cold, wet evenings on the trail? When you pitched up at a shelter and there was nothing you would have rather had than a beautiful, hot, home-cooked meal. Well, apart from actually going home, you could try out one of the delicious meals from Trailtopia. Why not dig into their spectacular jambalaya with its authentic Creole flavour? Or how about their beef stew, which is loaded with beef, potatoes, carrots, mushrooms, corn, green beans and green bell pepper in a fantastic beef gravy. Go on, try them. Trust me, you'll love them. Trailtopia, the best of home cooking away from home. So now, prepare to listen to a lovely, articulate young married couple who not only love this show, but also now love the Appalachian Trail. Here are Anna and Brandon Jones, or Sweet Tea and Moose. Okay. I'd like to introduce you to Anna Jones, or Sweet Tea, and her husband, Brandon, or Moose. Hi, Anna. How are you? I'm doing well, Steve. How are you? I'm not too bad. In case listeners are wondering why I didn't introduce or say hi to Brandon, he's there apparently if required. So uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, Now, you're doing a flip-flop, and I've been trying to push this name Oboe, because somebody suggested it to me, out back and out again. Um, You've been doing this flip-flop or Oboe since May, and I told you then, when you wrote to me, that um, when you had 500 miles under your belt, um, to call me back. So I wanted to speak to some flip-floppers. Uh, how far have you now hiked? We have reached about 650 miles at this point. I'd have to do the exact calculation, but we are in Rutland, Vermont. Wow, so you're about a uh, third of the way through. Yes. Uh, yes. Have, you, have you started to look at it like that? Do you, uh, do you start looking at the... Um, uh, uh, the percentages I know I did to try to get some some context of how far I'd actually gone. Absolutely, I remember when we were ten percent done, and I thought that was encouraging. Yes, Moose didn't think that was as encouraging, but <laughs> when um, we got to you know almost seven hundred miles, we realized, wow, you know we're two months into this. We've done almost a third of the hike. I think it was really um, encouraging and motivating for us. I'm sure. I'm sure it was. And is this your first? really long distance hike or are the two of you quite experienced absolutely it's our first long distance hike we've had experience um camping and we live near Irwin, tennessee so we i know you do to... but well, i know you do so when, yeah. I put, when i put in four two three the number uh miss janet's name came up so i knew she was Irwin, oh. tennessee <laughs> 
Wow. And we've unfortunately never met Miss Janet, but we um, live near Irwin, Tennessee, and are able to go on hikes, you know, around Mountain and in that area. So we are familiar with the trail, but definitely no experience long distance backpacking. Okay. So why the AT then? Why has it been a goal for both of you or do one of you have to persuade the other one to do it? <laughs> so it actually originated with myself, but um, when we first started dating about six years ago, we knew we were both interested in the outdoors and just just mentioned that um, hiking the Appalachian Trail would have been something that we would enjoy, but we thought that could never be a possibility. <laughs> but while we, while we were in college, um, at Milligan College near Irwin, Jennifer Farr Davis actually came and spoke at one of our chapel services. Right. And um, she was just so kind, and we had a um, meet and greet with her, and we actually went on a small hike with her. And so I was, you know, just starstruck, and I read all her books and was just really interested in her story. And then a few years later, she came back to our college and spoke again and had her second book at that point. And I just um, couldn't get the idea out of my head. One night, I just sat up and thought, we have got to hike the Appalachian Trail. And I told my husband, and we looked at our, you know, at our timeline to see if we could fit it in. And we started planning about two years ago. So don't mind me asking, how old are the two of you? So I'm 24. I turned 25 in a few weeks, is my hesitation. And right. Moose actually just turned 26. A week ago. So how would I, I've often wondered this? How people have the ability to take six months out of their lives, and it's more than six months, by the way, because there's the preparation and before, and then there's also the coming down afterwards as well. Uh, how how were you able to do that? Yeah, I get that question a lot. Um, I was since we were planned about two years ago, we were able to just save our money and put it aside to have enough to budget for the actual hike itself. And um, I had told my coworkers this is what I was interested in doing. Yeah. And then come May of this year, I told them I'm going to be leaving. And Moose actually graduated with his master's degree in May. And All that right. was part of the reason we, we had chosen to do a flip-flop, just because we weren't able to start before, um, before May. Right. Oh, I see. That. So that, that was the purpose. So it wasn't, wasn't the, the normal reason for doing hit, uh, a flip-flop, uh, which is basically to help, help the trail. But it's definitely helping the trail that you're doing it. And I love, I love the fact that people yeah. are doing it more, yeah. more and more. Well, I'm sure that makes you feel even better, doesn't it? Yeah, and we looked into flip-flopping, and um, we're fortunate that that was an option. But we're just really thrilled by um, all that the Appalachian Trail promotes about, through, about flip-flopping. And um, we were just on board and we're wondering, you know, how many people would actually be out there flip-flopping. But there's, there's a lot of flip-floppers out there. I'm sure there are. It's, it, you know, it's, it's certainly catching on. And has any, <laughs> any name other than flip-flop caught on yet? You know, I'm really pushing for, for oboe. Everyone, meant, everyone still calls himself a flip-flopper. Oh, um, I personally love the no-so. I oh. thought that was neat. <laughs> No, sir. And oh, no, sir. That's a good one, yeah. Going. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted cool. to get that going, but everyone just says flip-flop. Ah, darn. Oh, dear. I know. <laughs> so, so you decided you wanted to do it, and, and you did say that when you wrote, first wrote to me, you, you wrote that you, you'd listened to all the podcasts you'd caught up. Yes. Apparently, you'd been binge listening, and I love the idea of that, by the way. And you, <laughs> you, you kindly said that some of our guests had helped you and your husband in your preparations. Who did you learn from, what, and what did you learn? Oh, my goodness. Um, I guess I've learned a little bit from everybody. And what really I learned the most from the Mighty Blue podcast has just been the motivating factor to get out there. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't think I would listen to an Appalachian Trail podcast while I was on the Appalachian Trail. <laughs> but I've even learned that since you've continued to update and, you know, have new guests, I listen to those. And it, it reminds me of my motivation to be out there. Um, but of course, while Moose was studying for his master's, he didn't really get to learn as much and study as much as I did. So when I would learn something from your show, I would inform him, whether it be um, something from DocSpot or information about taking care of your feet and yeah. blisters. Wasn't she great? Um, wasn't wasn't Dr. Lynn great? Oh, 
It's awesome. Absolutely. Isn't it? That was just so helpful. Yeah. It's Absolutely. interesting. Yeah. And I, I was, she and I talked about doing, doing, you know, doing that on the show and I didn't know how well it would go. I've had the most emails, more emails about her than anybody else, which is fantastic. I think. Wow. Yeah. And, and wow. I, I was really pleased about that. And do you have a favorite episode or do you think any of the episodes really struck you for any particular reason? Oh my goodness. Um, I've listened to, you know, over the last year I've listened to them, so I'm sure I won't be able to remember all the details of most <laughs> of them. But, um, you know, particularly the woman you interviewed who had um, difficulties with her lower legs being right. paralyzed, mm. um, stories like that or people who, you know, hike with their children, with the baby, you know, in the yes. family of three. And, Actually, yes. And, you know, have, where, you, have you seen the family, the Crawfords this year? No, we keep missing them. Oh, because they oh, must be up near you, so mustn't they? They must be somewhere near you. They are just, yep, I think they're just above us. And um, we will we will meet through hikers and they'll say, oh, we saw them this morning. And then by the evening, they'll say, oh, they just passed. <laughs> we have no idea how we missed them. I'm sure most of the listeners know um, about the Crawfords. In case they don't, Absolutely. is a mother and father with six children hiking the trail. Extraordinary people. Just, um, I, I love him watching. It is the one main YouTube channel I watch these days because I just, I'm just so drawn mm. to them. I really am. I'm desperate wow. to, inter desperate to interview them Harvey. as well, by the way. <laughs> Sorry. Who, who did you meet? We met Harvey. He is the man attempting to beat um, the 45 day record. Oh my gosh. To beat forty five days. Oh my god. When mm -hmm. how, is he quite is he on when you met him, was he on target? Um, he was a little behind. We met him in Vermont and at that point he was on day thirty six and he had, you know, about nine days to go right. and he had approximately six hundred miles left. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is... He was so nice and so kind and wanted to chat, but we just you know, wanted him to keep going and move faster. <laughs> Dear me. So, so you, you've met, and I think you've met some of the some of our uh, of our guests on the on the show, haven't you? As well, who, who did you meet? Yes, we met. Um, first, we met Field Trip. All right. He was at right. a friend's house nice and taking a rest to heal. Yeah, yeah, nice guy, Bill. Absolutely. Yeah. And we also met Crafty. Oh, did you? <laughs> Uh, he's funny. He was a funny guy. I really enjoyed having him on the show as well. A really oh, nice guy. absolutely. So tell me now, is the trail turning out as you'd expected it or hoped it would turn out? I would say it has definitely fulfilled all expectations and definitely exceeded expectations. It's a little, um, a little different than I expected in that I didn't quite um, realize how long the days were. <laughs> of course. And so I've had to adapt my thinking to the long term, hour by hour way of way of thinking about the trail. What did you find? Uh, uh, so when you first started, how early were you getting up? Because for me, that changing my get up time was definitely a really important thing. I, I just thought, set your alarm a half, an hour earlier, it will make so much difference. And it did every time. Absolutely. We started um, waking up about 7.30, which, you know, in hiker time is pretty late. Yeah. And we would get hiking by around 8.30. Yeah. Um, but this last week, we in Vermont, it was in the mid to high 80s all day long, wow. if not higher and we knew that if we did not get up earlier, we would just be hiking in the heat of the day. Uh, so we started waking up about 5.30, and that difference to get hiking before 7 and, you know, hiking most of our miles in the early morning, yeah. it was just, it was it was definitely a game changer. Yeah, it makes a lot, uh, to me, uh, there was, somebody said to me, I think they use the expression 10 by 12, if you can get 10 miles in by midday, 12 o'clock, then really the rest of the day is your own, isn't it? Because you can, exactly. you, can, you can do three or four more miles and you've still done 13 or 14. Or you could do 10 or even 15 more miles. And, you know, it's, that, it's getting that almost that base of mileage out of the way 
so that you can build on it for the rest of the day as as you choose. And and I think that's something exactly. took me a long took me a long time to learn that. By the way, so I used to be terrible at getting out getting out of camp. But uh, yeah, learning to, learning how to do that's kind of an important thing. So absolutely. So I'm sure you've got already memories that's going to last you for the rest of your lives. Can you think of a couple of standouts that you can share with us? Mm, wow. Um, yeah, I mean, every day there's something we're learning or an experience that, you know, we just say, we'll never forget this. And we try to write things down so we don't forget. Um, but I guess the, the biggest memories have been um, just just making friends along the trail in the community. Our first long day was in Pennsylvania, and we were trying to hit at least 20 miles. So mm. so we got our 20-mile mark, and um, as we're hiking, we – we're on our last mile. We were resting at a shelter for dinner before we were about to get to our campsite. And um, a girl we had just met the day before says, hey, guys, if you going to walk, you know, this extra few miles down the mountain, I live in this town. I think it was um, Palmerton, Pennsylvania, right. or Wind Gap. Wind oh, Gap. Wind Gap. Yep. Yeah, I know. Yep. And she said, you know, if you want to come in for the – for the night, we can stay at my at my parents' house, and cool. we can rest. And at this point, it was day 24 for us, and so we had not had a zero day. Not so one. Not one. We, the first 24. Not, oh, my gosh. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> we, we were ready for it. Mm. So we rushed down that mountain and just had, you know, a night in, a, in a someone's home and mm. just resting and having real food. Um, that was just one of the most remarkable memorable times on our trail don't you think though anna that it's the it's the giving nature of the people you meet on the trail and they're just you know to, the fact that they invited strangers really to their house speaks a lot of of the people who go out on that trail doesn't it really absolutely yeah just that they're so willing to to have you in their home not knowing anything about you and that is actually where we did meet field trip. So he had been invited into their home as well. So wow. it was basically like a little hiker hostel run by a sweet family. <laughs> I wonder. What, I wonder what it is about hikers that makes them want to do that. I don't. Know, once again, if mentioning the Crawfords, they get they seem to be taken in virtually every night these days. You know, they're they're getting right. so that's many wonderful. people, so many people helping them, and I, and I, I think that's great. You know, this isn't easy. This for me, I found it very difficult to complete the trail myself by myself without having to look after anybody else. The fact that this mother and mm-hmm. father have to look after six kids, even although the kids are fabulous, um, it is just remarkable to me. Um, I wonder if, if Moose could share a, share a standout that uh, he, he remembers. Yeah, so uh, Moose. What's one of your standout moments, you think? Standout moments? Hey, Moose, how um, are you? <laughs> hey, how are you, my blue? I'm pretty good, thanks. Uh, nice to talk to you. Yeah, I want to know, I, was, I just asked Anna, one of her standout moments in the five, in the 600 or 700 miles you've done so far. What is, what have, is there something you can think back on thinking, man, I'm going to think about that the rest of my life? Um, if, the answer, yeah, so, if the answer's no, it's okay. <laughs> no, I, there, there's so many really great moments. Because after I got my master's, I really wanted this the trail to be somewhat of a pilgrimage from sure. academics to real life. Yes. And so I've been thinking a lot about um, how the trail uh, is a beautiful metaphor for a lot of different things. Definitely. And one of my favorite moments was when um, I accidentally left my cell phone four miles back at a uh, shelter because we took a nap at a shelter. Right. And... Um, so I thought a 13 mile day was going to end up being a 21 mile day or something crazy. Yeah. And so I started walking back. I found within a mile, um, some hikers that I met at a previous shelter that we slept at prior. Right. And I said, man, yeah, I gotta, gotta go walk back for my cell phone. And they immediately dropped everything they had started making phone calls um, trying to connect me to a hiker that was further behind hmm. and come to find out there was a hiker that was a mile away from that shelter. She dropped everything she had. Her name was river, uh, so that she could run back a mile, pick up my phone and meet me further down the trail. So I didn't have to walk the four miles. Wow. That's great. It's, yeah. That, it's just a, a beautiful moment of someone willing to care for you, even though we just met, um, I think that's great. The hospitality of the trail is beautiful. It's interesting you say that because as you were speaking, I thought to myself, 
If I'd stopped, I don't know, and had a rest somewhere in in the city or in normal life and walked four miles away and then thought, oh, I left my phone back there, I'll just go back and get it, I, would, I wouldn't even bother going back. I'd assume it had been stolen. You probably went back thinking, well, I'm sure it won't be stolen. You know, I, I always felt on the trail that everything was safe, didn't you? Absolutely. Uh, the, the only thing I thought that could have happened with my phone was someone grabbed it to walk it to me because yes, I, there was yes. a couple of people at the shelter with me. And the only possibility that popped in my head was someone bringing it to me already. But um, yeah, it was sitting right where I left it. That's no one cool. touched it. That is so cool. So how's this, how has it been sharing this adventure with your spouse? You know, this is not every, not every couple could do that, you know, spend six months entirely in each other's company. How have you enjoyed it, the two of you? That has been my biggest uh, reason for the trail. Um, because prior to the trail, my wife was a night shift ER nurse All right. and I was a day shift uh full-time student and so we always saw each other for dinner but we it was pretty much in passing that I saw my wife for the first two years of our marriage wow And so I knew the trail was going to be us together uh, every single day Um, and I was excited about that and it has blown my mind Um, on the days that we're exhausted we can still lay in our tent giggle um, laugh and just be a couple, uh, but on the days that we're really struggling, we can separate for a little bit and know that um, in a couple of miles, we're going to come back together and be fine. It's nice being in the vicinity of somebody, isn't it? You know, somebody who, who you love, I mean. It's, it's just lovely being in the vicinity of that person and not, you know, they don't have to be in your eyesight. You just know they're around, and that's a really nice thing, I think. You haven't had that too much of that, have you? No, no, I haven't been able to share most of our life as a married couple together, and this yeah. is um, a powerful thing to share together. Yeah. How do you feel about that, Anna? Yeah, so, I mean, we knew uh, people had warned, you know, are you guys going to get sick of each other? Are you going to argue? <laughs> but I see hikers hiking solo, particularly uh, solo women, and, you know, I think of all the things they they often must think about, you know, sometimes we'll go a whole day without seeing somebody. Most times we see 10, 15 yeah. people. Yeah. But on the days where we feel like we're out there by ourselves, you know, a solo hiker truly might be by themselves for a day. And um, sometimes, you know, when you have the accordion effect, someone likes to call it where you're all together one moment and then yes. everyone spreads it out yes. and you're all together. Um, in those moments where you're spread out, we'll go a few days without seeing many through hikers and we enjoy that community so much that we, you know, often wish we were with other people, but in the end of the day, we still have each other and, yeah. you know, whether it's sharing chores or just have someone, someone there, you know, during a thunderstorm or a lightning storm, it's just comforting to have, you know, someone you care for so yes. close. How have you found the, have you, have you had actually had a thunderstorm in the middle of the night with lightning all around you? Yes, we sure did. Our Isn't that terrifying? Night, <laughs> absolutely terrifying. It was our third night and it was the night before Mother's Day. It was a Saturday and we were up on Annapolis Rocks. It was um, a, a cliff overlook and we had not seen that there was supposed to be a thunder and lightning storm. Right. Um, so... About four o'clock in the morning, we get woken up to lightning as we're sleeping, you know, on the top of this mountain and we're on our phones researching what to do in a lightning and thunderstorm um, because we'd slept in the rain plenty of times, but the thunder and lightning was a new element and we really wanted to be as safe as possible and um, it was definitely a, a bit scary. Do you say, were you in your tent that night or were you in a shelter? We were in our tent. Um, uh, this this area didn't have any shelter, so we were sleeping in our tent at a campsite. That worried me. I remember I remember hearing a clap of thunder, or oh, it seemed like miles and miles away. Then about 20 minutes later, I heard this huge clap of thunder. It was right above me. And the, th- thought, for wow. me, the thought for me was uh, a tree being struck by lightning. And I wouldn't have known, would I? If it fallen on my tent, I wouldn't have known until mm-hmm. it fell there. So, exactly. Yeah. We had the same thought, and I thought, I'd rather be awake if it falls on me. Yeah. I don't know. It was it was very very scary. Yeah. So how did now? I, actually, I, I thought about this this morning actually, and I hadn't thought about it before. You started in Harper's, 
Um, so, mm-hmm. so, so you hit the rocks at Pennsylvania pretty quickly, don't you? So, yes. So were you prepared for that? Because, you know, I know they're so tough. Were you physically prepared for it by then? Um, we, it, yes and no. Pennsylvania, um, being called Rocksylvania, we yes. knew that the rocks would be bad and difficult and frustrating. And the fortunate thing about Pennsylvania is it's, for the most part, relatively flat. So cardiovascularly, we didn't have as much of an issue, but um, Pennsylvania, we say, is the place that got us used to being on our feet for eight to 10 hours a day. Um, The problem was that most of the time you're walking, your feet are just at such terrible angles and you're, you know, walking on these slick rocks that it's hard to walk just normally like you would on another trail. So towards the end, the last two days were really miserable, and we were very glad to be out of Pennsylvania. Yeah, I, I don't think too many people are, are, are unhappy when they get to Delaware Water Gap, are they? It's like a big celebration. Absolutely. Although, although New Jersey and New York keep on with the rocks, don't they? There's no question about that. Yep, they sure do, and they, they start to really turn into a trail. It's almost as if we magically expect the rocks to disappear, isn't it? <laughs> they just don't. Exactly. Yeah, oh, dear. Someone said... The Pennsylvania rocks just turn into New York and New Jersey rocks. That's right. So that helped me kind of mentally prepare that they wouldn't just disappear. But slowly but surely, the, it, it slowly started turning into an actual trail where there's more dirt and yeah. flat pa- places to put your feet. Have you had many uh, wildlife encounters at all? Um, Pennsylvania, we saw many, many snakes. And moose actually came about two inches from stepping on a rattlesnake. Oh, nice, nice. How did, yep. And I, I, presume, I presume he heard it before, but that's how he found out about it. Is that right? Um, the first one that day we heard and we're able just to kind of shoo it off the trail. Oh. And the second one, we were trying to hike quickly up this, this minor hill. We were hiking at a decent pace. And I think the, the snake must have been sleeping. So by the time Moose stepped down, it startled the snake. And it started it started rattling well after he had moved. So oh. so it it was a very close close call. Any bears? Yes, we saw one bear in New Jersey, um, which I was very excited about. Only one. And were you, were you nervous Only. about were you nervous about it? Um, I was anticipating my first bear, and I was so excited. And it was actually I think our last day in New Jersey, and I just was was really wanting to see one and um sure as enough we were hiking and we were hiking down this ledge and then there was a, a ridge up top that the moose the, the um bear yeah. was hanging out and i stopped and told moose that we happened to be hiking together and i said um there's a bear there's a bear and we just made noise and kind of um you know tried to tried to you know be be big or whatever <laughs> they say and the bear just kind of went okay, and just <laughs> turned around. Yes, he could give he could give a crap, could he? It's it's amazing. Oh I, yeah, yeah, it was. I think your first encounter with with bears, particularly. I mean, I was really anticipating, really excited, and kind of nervous about it. But when I, my first bears were four jumping out of a tree, which was amazing, and I video oh, yeah. and I videoed it as well, which was great. But for me, as soon as I saw them, I thought they want absolutely nothing to do with me. They just want to go in a totally exactly. different direction, and you, and you get this fantastic feeling that these are wild animals, but they're they're wild because they live in the wild, not because they're bloody crazy. You know, they are exactly. they're, they're there. They just don't want anything to do with you. So anybody who ever listens to these shows or reads books and worries about animals, certainly bears are not anything to worry about. The ones really to worry about, no. and I'm going to ask you about them, are ticks. Have you had many ticks? We have not had many. Um, I did have one actually attached to me in um, New Jersey, and that I don't know, you know, how or when, but I I remember it crawling on me, and then I was I was starting to fall asleep, so I thought nothing of it, and then a few hours later, I woke up to use the restroom, and I looked down at my foot, and he had just gotten, I, I presume, just gotten attached within yeah. that bit of time, so. Uh. I was able to get it off and clean it, but yeah. we try to check every single night just to be sure. And, definitely. Um, you know, we are definitely trying to be very aware of the tick situation. 
Now, I've, I've had a bit of a brain freeze here. Is it's, it's Connecticut, Massachusetts? Yes, New Hampshire is your next state. I'm just trying to think. Yeah, New Hampshire is your next state, isn't yes. it? Yes. Yeah. So I bet you're looking forward to that, aren't you? I mean, is there anywhere? We any, are. Which, where, where are you particularly looking forward to? Um, you just hear so many stories about the beauty of New Hampshire. And, um, of course, it's also followed by um, the anticipation of the white yeah. and being nervous about that. I think the biggest thing is we've had to prepare ourselves that, you know, we may not go very many miles in the whites and we may not um, be able to hit, you know, hit our biggest mileage days or anything like that. But just getting through safely and um, and also enjoying the experience, I think, is what we're trying to prepare ourselves for, um, uh, trying to get our packs as small as possible to yes. um, to maneuver through some of these some of these challenging um Trains, I think, will be still something we keep in on the mind. So, um, yeah, we're very, we're very excited, but definitely a bit nervous as well. But I tell you what, though, it, it's you've really put in the practice already. You know, you know how to do this now. You've got the miles on your legs, and I think this is the time to really, really enjoy it. I mean, for me, it was the end of my journey. For you, it's halfway, obviously. But even then, right. the, the enjoyment is so it's so magnificent up there. And try to get, try to go through perhaps zero somewhere if the weather is going to be lousy for going through the, the whites because you, mm. you're never going to see anything like I'd never seen anything like it in my whole life. And it was the, the wow. most magnificent thing to see. And then I went through one other range. I can't remember where it was. And the, it, the weather was terrible, so I couldn't see any views. Seeing those views, you will mm. never forget them as long as you live. That is good advice. We'll, we'll keep that in mind. For sure. Yeah. And and do you have any... any um, uh, strategy for the hundred mile wilderness. What are you going to do with that? Um, we haven't. We've talked about it just briefly and um, talked about maybe what our mileage might be. And you know, we really aren't um, aren't quite sure yet. I think once we get through the whites, we'll be able to kind of focus our focus our minds on Maine. It just seems so unbelievable that yes. you know Maine can even be in the conversation yet. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but since you know since since we started in Pennsylvania and since um, we're doing the flip flop, it's just slowly gotten harder, which for us has been, been a good thing. So yeah. we've, you know, um, gotten our trail legs. Yes. And so I think by the time we get to Maine, we're going to be able to push ourselves a little bit um, and get that halfway point completed. Now this is a question for both of you, actually. Um, actually, before I ask the question, I want to ask you why you sweet tea. And I really want to know why brand is moose. <laughs> Oh my goodness. So mine's actually interesting. I am from Tennessee. Um, and most people assume that my sweet tea name is from that, but actually, um, the first few days on the trail, we are with this wonderful group of flip floppers who we still call our first tramley. Yes. Um, we were together for about 12 or 14 days until we all kind of split up in, in different directions. Yeah. And, um, anyway, I was with a female hiker just talking and, she was talking about how much of a pain it is to have to get off the trail to go to the bathroom so often. And I realized I had not been drinking enough water to be going to the bathroom while hiking. <laughs> and she goes, she was absolutely just uh, disturbed by this. And she says, you need to be drinking more water. And then they all started laughing and said, your, your pee must look like sweet tea. <laughs> and they thought that was hilarious because uh -huh. I'm from Tennessee and, of course. So um, it, it kind of stuck. And I, I kept that name because it was my first family and yeah, um, they're just, just good people. And we thought it was funny. Uh, so you never thought of naming yourselves before you went out there? It's pro I mean, I, I did name myself because I just didn't want to be called England or anything like that. But uh, what about you? What about you, Brandon or Moose? Why were you called Moose? Yeah, my name actually came prior to the trail. Oh. Um, I was talking to my um, mentor prior to the trail telling him about, you know, our, our great idea. And he said, well, I already know your trail name, Moose. I said, what, why? He said, well, you're a big guy. You're protective, kind. Uh, and sometimes when you get excited, you get a little destructive. <laughs> and that has only... That has only proven to be true over the trail. <laughs> that is so funny. <laughs> so you, I bet you're looking forward to seeing moose as well. They are the most incredible thing to see. I, I'm excited for you because I know you're going to see some up there and it's just, well, you're just, I, I, I got blown away by seeing them. So, so you're moose. So of the two of you. Then, I really want to take a selfie. Oh, yes. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. But you don't, don't turn <laughs> your back. Try not to turn your back on him. I'll get a long way away if you do it. <laughs> 
So th- um, this is yeah. really, f- really for the two of you. Has the is there something you can each take away that the trail has taught you about yourselves since you started? Um, I'd say that in just kind of preparation and thinking about our experience so far, I would say, you know, you talked about it a lot on the show, just the, um, the difficulties of the trail being mostly mental. And of course the physical, the physical hardship is there and, you know, it's, it is physically demanding, especially as you get um, higher north and yes, the elevation yes. increases. So that part is obviously a, a challenge. But um, just the the difficulties mentally when you've hiked, you know, eight hours, but you still know you have two hours more to hike, or <laughs> you know, you're so hot and sweaty and tired, you just you just want to to stop for the day, but you know you have more miles to complete. Um, that that mental that mental um, challenge has been something that I have learned to um, to face, and I've actually learned to conquer it in, in in some ways. Every day that I climb the large mountain after I felt like I couldn't anymore, um, it just proves it proves to myself that I can push myself harder than than I thought, yep, and definitely. that you know determination and and having this trail as a as a goal. Um, is really attainable if you really just 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 work through the mental challenges. You're a spitfire, aren't you? I mean, you are so positive. <laughs> That's fantastic. I love that. What about you? What about you, Brandon? Yeah, I think I really want to bring the hospitality of the trail to the world. Um, I wouldn't that be nice? I love. Eh? Yeah, um, that that one time when we hiked uh, 21 miles with a girl named noodle and she let us stay at that, uh, her house. Yeah. Um, I was sitting around the table with field trip and a bunch of other hikers and we were having a beautiful meal together and field trip says, what do you want to do for the rest of your life? And I said, this right here, uh-huh. I want to invite people to my table, uh, share stories, uh, love them. Um, I want to change people's lives in those ways. And I see that mostly on the trail. So I want to bring that to the world. Well, I must say th- this, this was an unexpected conversation this morning. Um, I hadn't, you know, I knew we were going to t- talk and I started thinking about questions to ask you. You give me some great answers. So having learned something from some of our shows, you're now giving back to the show because I'm sure people are going to mm. get so much from listening to you guys. And I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Absolutely. Thank you, Mighty Blue. Thanks, Mighty Blue. It's been a lot of fun, all right? You take it easy. And uh, when you finish, get in touch again and talk us through the rest of your hike. Absolutely. We'd be happy to. That'd be great. Okay. Well, I'll speak with you soon. Um, But uh, for now, goodbye and uh, we'll catch up soon. Thank you. All right. We'll talk to you later. Bye. Aren't they an engaging, well-rounded young couple? I was so impressed with their thoughtful responses, and I think they've got what it takes to go the whole way. And yet another couple inspired by Jennifer Farr Davis. She really has some influence, and she puts it to great use. More power to her. I've got to say, young Moose won a whole lot of brownie points with his answer about the joys of spending 24 hours a day with Anna. Good call, Moose. Lastly, their takeaways were absolutely perfect. Anna has learned that she can push herself harder than she ever thought possible, Well, Moose wants to bring the goodness he's finding on the trail into the home. Now that is an ambition to pursue. As I say, I got these guys from an email. If you have a story to tell, don't forget to let me know and maybe you'll be on the show soon. People love to hear other people succeeding and your success may well be the proverbial kick up the arse that another listener needs to strap on their boots. Now, if I hit it again. And Caesar Becerra. I spoke with him a couple of weeks ago and he had clearly given it some thought. Here's Caesar. Okay, we're on now with a guest from one of our very early shows. I believe it was show number five, Caesar Becerra. Hi, Caesar. How are you? How's it going? Wonderful. Oh, good, good, good. Now, um, you were a guest with your former wife, Maud uh, Dillingham, um, back uh, when you were talking about your thorough hike back in 2001. And I know that this was quite some time ago, and obviously the trail has changed quite substantially since then. Um, is there... I'm, I'm sure there is. There's, there must be tons about that hike that were you to do it again that you would th- you think you'd do radically different uh, from when you did it in 2001. Well, yeah. One of the things that uh, 
we had attacked in this style called thorough hiking, which is uh, work smarter, not harder, and, and you know, and, and <laughs> really smell the roses a little more. I think we smell the roses really, really hard <laughs> in terms of, uh, you know, we, we, we set our, uh, our drop boxes almost for pickup every two or three days, which meant we had to uh, race out and, and hitchhike to towns that weren't necessarily trail towns. Right. Um, and now, although that was good on the pack weight because our pack weight was roughly 15 pounds in the summerish wow. spring and then uh, 20 pounds in the winter, when we got to the boxes, there were a lot of things that we noticed after three, four, five, six weeks and two months or whatever on the trail. Ooh, why do we pack that? <laughs> I'm sure that's a sentiment heard around the uh, trail community. But one of the things was uh, these little tiny vials for uh, shampoo and conditioners and stuff, <laughs> you know, where we, we definitely were, uh, you know, you got to really think that whole adage that you should, uh, you know, fill your card up and then before you go to check out, you know, ha put it in half. Yeah. Uh, that should have been something that uh, definitely, but that's a serious one in terms of pack weight and time. You know, we did hemorrhage a lot of time getting to and from trail town. But you were in no but hurry. Still, Caesar, you were, in, you were in no hurry though, were you? No. you I think you were on, on no, trial for about no. 11 months, weren't you? Something, something incredibly long period of time. Yeah. We didn't really have a massive hard date, but, uh, it definitely went longer than we thought. We originally thought it was like 10 or 11 months. It turned out to be a year and 23 days through four seasons. Wow. Um, but now some of the silly things that I would do again, uh, which is a very, very, very category of silly, was uh, interview uh, uh, Earl Schaefer yes. inside a place that the wind wasn't as high. <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> which, on <laughs> one hand, that. it was an honor to, to interview Earl Schaefer and be with him. But when we realized later, when we looked at the footage, we, we were at Pine Grove Furnace State Park, which is very uh, apropos yes. near his home back then. Uh, but, you know, it was uh, hard to hear him. So that was a, a little tiny uh, thing. Then footwear, I would say another thing was footwear. Um, in the winter time, I felt that I really needed boots and, um, you know, in some cases, yes, we did need boots, but luck as luck would have it, uh, that winter was very mild, right. uh, 2001 and 2002. Uh, and the trail was pretty packed hard with snow, you know, some high, uh, hunters or what have you. I really didn't need the big winter boots. Um, but you know, that's hindsight. I, I could have need them. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, I think I would just, um, take in some towns a little more. I mean, I think, uh, you have this adage of a zero day. Yeah. Uh, how about a double zero day or, or James <laughs> bonded a triple zero or a double zero. <laughs> Oh dear. No, no. I, I, know, I, I would get out of it, I think, if I spent too much time in towns, I must admit. I mean, yeah, I, went, well, I went in quite often. I, I, I think I, I met a number of people who did triple zeros, and, and I don't know how you would then get back into it. For me, it was a case of just having to keep going to make sure I got to the end eventually. That's true. I mean, I think the sweet spot is two. Uh, one, to just get, you know, you, you go up the next day after sleeping in a nice bed somewhere, you don't want to move, you know, yes, it's, yes. it's hard to get out there. Yeah. Uh, three is too much. I think two might be the, it could, the, be, uh, the, it could be the sweet spot. spot. Yeah, it could well be. Now I know obviously you, you're no longer uh, with Maud, but was, did you enjoy hiking the trail with Maud though? Yes, of course we did. Of course I did. I mean, she does point out in our famous little documentary that, uh, we also had epic fights, yes. uh, you know, which happens. Cool. And she, she recorded some of those with great uh, uh, passion and hilarity in some cases. And and foresight was, uh, things were cracking on other levels. But it was also a, a joyous, uh, amazing uh, journey. Um, Would you, and, uh, you go. I've got to ask yeah. you this. I wrote it down. I didn't know whether to ask you or not, but I'm going to. Um, would you ever hike with Maud again? Sure. Oh, cool. uh, I don't know if I'll ever do a thorough hike or a through hike again. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, and I've hiked with her small little quick trails, you know, for a day or two. But right. um, yeah, I don't know. I, I I would I would, but I don't I don't think I'd ever do the trail again. 
if I ever did the trail again, one thing that I'd do differently is I'd section hike it. Right. Uh, back then, I was uh, romanced by the notion of the through hike. Yes, and I'm it sure. is romantic. It, it is, is epic. And it is a, a rite of passage in a certain way. But uh, I'm no longer that way. I, and I, and I, when everybody asked me about hiking on any long distance trail, I said, listen, you got the time. I would break it up and, uh, and do it in pieces. Yeah. Um, that way you are going out there when you want. So there was a little bit of masochism going out there and, and staying out there, and especially during winter, which, you know. Yeah, that was uh, tough. That was, was tough. Unique. Yeah, that was tough. It was tough, but uh, it was also beautiful. I mean, it was the only time, any time on the trip where we wouldn't see another soul, um, which yeah. had its own beauty in, 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 in that sense. Now, I know you went with Trudy, the dog, who sadly is no longer, um, no longer around. Yeah. Do, did you yeah, have you reflected course. since on the whether it was a good thing to go with the dog or not? Absolutely, I don't, I have my sincere doubt whether we would have truly finished the trail without Trudy. There's a there's a a healthy tenant to thorough hiking, which is try to bring onto the trail either physically or metaphorically or uh, symbolically another project of some sort something to to kindly get your 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 head off of the uh of of the not to say that it's always you know uh, kind of a, a hard scramble to, to to hike but some days it can be yeah. and having something else we had our newsletter to write we had trudy yeah. to take care of it also to trudy to make us laugh <laughs> uh, and entertain us so you know, I no, I, I had no no uh, pangs, and and again, uh, she was really a, a champion. Minus one moment where she got pancreatitis due to eating a little mouse, oh, from what the vet told us. Yeah. But I think it was a great uh, decision to bring her out there. And, and what did you learn from your hike seventeen years ago? That were you to do this again, you would put into place now. Is there one particular thing you learned from that full experience? that you would say, this is a must-do thing? Well, I don't know if it's a particular thing, but it is a philosophy that, for sure, everything that you're looking at, about to do, conquer, conquer or if you're looking at the map and you're like, man, look at this climb, yeah. it all ends up being a lot easier than what it looks like. <laughs> uh, and so those dark days where it's uh it's crazy raining and all that good stuff you know it you look you look back and i really realized it was a lot worse than what it was and you derive from that challenge uh honestly the ability i don't know if this is good or bad but a, a superman type outlook where you, you you feel you can really do whatever you put your mind to yeah, I'm um, sure. and I'm so sure. that that's good and bad. <laughs> yeah, there's a, a bunch of things I will not <laughs> uh, ever, you know, uh, scare away from now because I look back and I say, you know what? If I hike the Appalachian Trail, and I assure you, I was the last person years ago that I ever thought would hike the Appalachian Trail. I could do anything. Yes, yes. I think a lot of people take that take that away from their experience in the trail, which I think is a great thing to have as well. And I know that you made quite a lot of use of technology and so on on the trail. You know, you you were actually quite doing a, a video, which must be one of the earlier videos on the trail, I guess. Um, would you make use of it and do a full YouTube channel because of the film that you and Moore have made? I guess that would that give you a hunger to do that sort of that type of thing again? Wow, that's a really good point. Um, the type of technology back then, the mini, uh, you know, disc DV, yes. mini digital, uh, it, was, it was kind of a pain. I mean, you know, we had to, you only know, had one hour of film time and you had to literally physically ship that thing back and then get a new one, yes. which we shipped in boxes. So, and you're limited to one hour. So you felt like you had to be very careful. Um, so we shot, you know, I think about 70 hours worth of footage on the trail wow. which is remarkable it even is. if you had a, a nice a nice light iphone today uh but boy today how, what a difference you know you can shoot it press forget press then you can just shoot it and have uh, areas that you're on live yes i'm amazing. sure if you're near the, uh, the right cell tower yeah. um i don't know if that's going to be a good thing today for me i feel like to uh later in life 
uh, right now, uh, I do things, and sometimes I don't even film them or shoot them. Uh, occasionally I will, but not as much. Uh, and actually, I've been criticized on occasions that I don't promote my current walk that I've been doing for the last 14 summers across the nation. All right. Key West to Phoenix so far. <laughs> wow. To Arizona. How many miles is that altogether? So, the last 14, 3,200 roughly oh, um, since, since 2004. Uh-huh. But, you know, a lot of people say, wait a second, you were out there again? I, I didn't see any photos. I'm like, well, yeah, you know, I don't know. I just. I just I walk for the pleasure of it now and and for the ridiculousness of it now. I mean, uh, it's kind of more of a, a toxic bomb of getting away from the the crazy fast paced life of the modern age yeah, yeah. and uh, kind of reverting back to uh, to nothing. <laughs> yeah. Well, like, you know, I, I knew that when I I, I actually initially wasn't going to uh, invite you onto the show because I, I you had such a different through hike, more different than any other hike I've heard. That I would have thought the whole thing would change, but by and large, you were pretty you were pretty solid about what you did at the time, and you kept a great record of it as well. So I'm glad I did um, circle back and uh, have you back on the show. I have one more great story about how uh, I oh, please, go integrate on. Yeah. Uh, uh, thorough hiking into my life. Now, the last section I did in just outside Phoenix, where temperatures are reaching close to 113 wow. degrees, which is weird. I, I like to detox out there and sweat to the oldies. <laughs> but one thing I did is I, I had a friend of mine, uh, Diane Leave, uh, help me out of Phoenix, uh, seed the route with water bottles, which is nothing new, uh, so I'd have water. Right, but nice. also one thing I did is I, I at some uh, at some dollar store or some uh discount store there were these tents these children like type walmart tents real tiny only i could fit in them uh and even then i have to like you know cower down and curl up but they're eight dollars a piece and i go eight dollars that's crazy i bought five of them and i put them out there every 10 miles talk about thorough hiking and lightweight hiking so i would i would ditch them out there alongside the water bottles uh, water bottles every one mile, tents every ten. So I would actually walk to my tent uh, and actually leave food in there and everything. So everything, I mean, I was literally whistling Dixie and, and just dipping through the tulips with, with very little Jeez. on my back. Jeez. Um, you know, it's the pure love of just walking. Yes. And some would call that mega cheating and, and all that good stuff. No, but, hey, I was still not. dealing with 113-degree weather, which when 113 is about 149 on the pavement. Oh. So the, the heat was literally melting my shoes. Wow. Um, wow. So I didn't feel bad about it, but it, it is interesting. Once you become a a, a lightweight uh, uh, Nazi, so to speak, I hate to use that term, but it's true. You become you become infatuated with wanting to uh, continue to keep it lightweight. Yes, I'm sure you do. <laughs> I'm sure you do. I, 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 I I've got a bring my weight down for for next year so uh, i'm really to, really gonna think hard about what i actually take on my trip as well this time so yeah, that'd be great well look good great to catch up with you again i'm actually going to follow up with maud and see if she'd like to do this as well it'd be lovely to catch her have her perspective see how she would change things as well absolutely 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 okay, you got it well good to talk to you hopefully and we'll speak again one day you got it buddy hey take care cheers bye he got an interview with Earl Schaefer, which was super cool, by the way, but would have preferred to have done it better. Wouldn't we all want to relive some of those highlight reels and perhaps do them a little better? And he's now walking across America in sections. He's reached Phoenix from Key West. I drove out of Florida along the Panhandle last year, and that is a long way to go in a car. He's reached Phoenix. Very nice. Now, I'd like to tell you a little more about my plans for this show. I know I haven't spoken much about it, but I had intended to take a break after episode number 100 on August the 18th to prepare and introduce my next show, Mighty Blue on the Camino de Santiago. A very dear friend and mentor, Glenn the Geek Hebert, suggested that I should just continue with this show and have my Camino adventures for the four or five weeks that I'm actually hiking as the show. I've got some new music and artwork, but it will still fall under Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail to keep some continuity. Once that hike is over, I'll be back with pretty much the same format as we currently have, though I'll be producing it from somewhere in Europe. Then, from about March the 1st next year, I hope to be taking the show on the road once more as I podcast directly from the Appalachian Trail. 
With this, I plan to have shorter episodes, but to put them out almost immediately. That way, you'll know pretty much where I am and what's going on. I'll interview fellow hikers, hostel owners, and trail angels on the trail, and hope to have the opportunity of meeting a few of you, the show's listeners. I'll let you know when and where I'm going to be in town, and would be happy to have a beer or a glass of wine with any of you and chat about the trail. This is going to be a fun year, and I hope that some of you would like to be a part of it. Finally, let's finish off Chapter 6 of The Year We Seize the Day. I've already warned you that there are a couple of beeps, but to be frank, I'm pretty sure that most of you will be able to work out exactly what is being beeped out. I'll see you next week. Colin. Forest. Life is like a box of chocolates. The wine fountain should have been a high point, something to marvel and chuckle over for the rest of the day, but I'm schlepping my own dark cloud around with me today. Too much thinking. In my life, I organise distractions so I don't have to listen to what goes on in my head. It's worked until now. Out here, there's nothing else to do but think. Heartbreak is not just a word. If you have it, you know it. It's like a toothache, only all over your body. It won't let you be. Thus far, I've lived a semi-charmed kind of life, but here, I'm suddenly stalked by demons from my past and we've only just begun. They say time heals all wounds. The people who say this to you mean well, but they have clearly never been wounded. Or perhaps time can heal wounds, but can it heal disillusion? For all my cynicism about religion, I suspect I'm here looking for a spiritual redemption. I'm not alone in my search. An Irish couple we meet tell me they are doing it for penance. A dumpy blonde Austrian is doing it as part of her grieving, after her mother died and she walked out of her house and just kept walking. So far, she has walked nearly 3,000 kilometres. When she gets to Santiago, she will turn around and walk all the way back. We have nicknamed her Forrest Gumpenberger. Walk, Forrest, walk! There's a Swiss-German from Basel who's doing it as a physical challenge. Simon and Mercedes are not sure why they're doing it. They're searching for something, but they don't know what. At the Albergue in Montjardin, I meet Leslie, a hostelero from the States. She walked the Camino three years ago and now she's back as a volunteer, manning this sleepy old bag in a quiet hilltop village somewhere between Pamplona and Logroño. I did the way because friends of mine in the States had done it and were so taken with it. There was no transformation, at least not for me. I got back after my walk just before 9-11. I lost a lot of friends there. Things like that make you realise you're not in control of anything. Like that John Lennon song, Life happens when you're busy making other plans. I guess that's what you learn most of all. You're really not in control. You plan to walk the Camino, but the Camino walks you. Nothing ever works out the way you plan. You can throw a knee, get sick, a thousand things can happen. And in a way, this is what spirituality is. The realisation that you're not ultimately in control of life. Friends die in car accidents. Family members get sick or someone you love falls in love with someone else. Life itself is a humbling before God. Humility. Perhaps it is what this is all about. I suspect I've always been an arrogant bastard behind the smile. Life has finally caught up with me. I don't want to lead a spiritual life. I just want this pain to go away. Find a healing from the knowledge of being both betrayer and betrayed and from the loss of my illusions. They may not have been real, but they were comfortable and they were safe. And being comfortable and safe, ask anyone, isn't that what life's about? Be comfortable and safe from life? Now, Forrest, how are you going to do that? Colin. I'll learn to say mañana tomorrow. Spanish is a wonderful language. It makes even the most banal objects seem exotic. Puente la Reina is actually only a town called Queensbridge. And take the word coronada, for example. A coronada is the word they use when you are wounded by a bull's horn. Horn up the arse is a coronada. When the bull runs off with your pancreas skewered on its horns like a scallop on brochette, it's still just a conada. Brilliant! Ellie has been attempting to teach herself Spanish. She's convinced she's a linguist, despite all evidence to the contrary, and will not be daunted. She has a sheet with useful French and Spanish phrases on it, and a notepad for new words, but she doesn't always read the right line. She tells a Japanese pilgrim her name is Melbourne, and she comes from Ham Sandwich. She tells fellow pilgrims, my name is Happy Walkings, 
it is impossible not to love her. That evening in Montjardin, she practices her Spanish some more at the local bar. The owners outnumber the locals three to two. There is Mama, a short, squat, garrulous woman with a laugh like a witch sucking helium. Her husband, a taciturn, grey-haired man with teeth like tombstones in a run-down municipal graveyard, and their daughter, who has a weight issue, tends bar and eats peanuts like she is feeding logs into a mulcher. Ellie orders beer in Spanish. They pretend not to understand, even though the only thing they have to drink is beer. And then we're offered the set menu. The menu del peregrino. The pilgrim's menu. Consists of soup, main course and postre, egg pudding, bread and a bottle of wine. They must know all pilgrims are hopeless booze hounds. I'll have the chicken, Ellie says. Peanut girl leans over and very deliberately puts a line through the chicken with a ballpoint pen. I guess the chicken's off, I tell her. That leaves pork, pork chops or pork balls. Or rice with pork. Do you like pork, Ellie? No, I hate it. But Ellie's blood sugars are screwed from the day's climb. She needs food and she needs it now. N-O-W. So she orders pork. An hour later, Mama is still cackling like a Cornish fishwife. Papa is teetering on the edge of his bar stool, completely wasted. And La Mulcherina is still filling her face with nuts. Ellie is getting very testy. She looks pale, her teeth chatter and her speech slurs. But it's not the beer. A hypoglycemic coma seems minutes away. Oh, I need food, Ellie shouts. Chiquita shrugs her shoulders and looks at Mama. Papa puts his head on the counter and starts to snore. Everything will happen when it happens. Have another beer. Have another peanut. Manana. Off. <laughs>